Today, I want to talk about connections. What do I mean by connections? So connections, by connections, I mean the way we connect our own body in certain movements and the way we connect to someone else's body. Uh, at the end of the day, when you work on transitioning through the ranges, one of the most important things is to understand the whole concept of connection. The more you can connect your body to someone else's, the more connection you will have. I mean, it's, it's in terms of 80-20, obviously if you crack someone on the jaw and you only hit them with the tip of your knuckle and it works, well, then there's not much connection. But by doing that, they, that makes you think, by getting the perfect punch, it means all the body is coordinated as a single unit so that you're perfectly uh, connected from toes all the way up through the hara, through the waki, the elbow, through the wrist. So everything is connected. But connections is actually very, very interesting. And so we have to look at techniques, blocks. It's a funny word. You know, we've been over it before, but when they talk about jodan uke, chudan uke, gedan barai, barai is more like it. They don't call it gedan uke because it definitely doesn't make sense to block down. A gedan barai, a barai is a Japanese word, harai or harao, which means to just um, carry away, you know, and that's more connected to to the whole notion of defense than, uh, than uh, um, the word block is, you know. So the word block, I guess, is a convenience when they had to translate the Japanese into English. It's an easy word to translate, uke. But, but uke, that which we call blocks, is actually, it means to receive something. So it, it, it's all about how you receive and Kyokushin, even though, as we've been over this before, even though it's recognized as a hard style, it's not. It's a soft style. It's a very soft style. It's a very circular style. It's probably more circular than a lot of um, styles. Um, so it's a hard training soft style. You never want to say that a technique, it's a really practical, it's a really good technique, unless you've actually tried it and proved it to yourself and tested it under pressure. And, a lot, and, and by getting these connections right, you'll find that uh, under pressure against a non-compliant opponent, the opportunity to press the, uh, test them and make them work really does make a difference. Okay, so you have kihon. You have standing kihon. We'll do some in a sec. And then you have moving basics, ido kihon, where you take those static motions and you put them with moving. Then kata. Kata takes the static, the movement, and changes angles. And with bunkai and the awareness of angles in bunkai, and you realize we've spoken about this before, if I have this little uh, illustration, I'm just going to draw it here. Oh, I didn't bring my iPad. I'll draw it on a piece of paper, though. We have this illustration in the dojo, and that's all it is. And basically what it reminds you is why do we – use angles in kata why do we hit it 45 degrees in kata why not 90 and 90 and it's because the human body is round so we have to also work the angles here okay so uh, kata introduce the angle changes that you need to transition from the moving basics into a more realistic thing and so this is why um, the, the flow is just beautiful from kihon to ido kihon to uh, kata and to kumite. Now, kumite, what you're doing in kumite is you're actually applying those movements that you do in a safe environment without anybody trying to kill you with aggression. You know, you're, you're actually applying willpower and you're trying to make those techniques work under a degree of pressure, okay? And in some kumite, in some competition or sporting competition endeavors uh it's as realistic as you can get without tearing each other's eyes out you know so don't underestimate the value of tournament fighting it really develops a lot of courage and a lot of reality and then of course the next step jisen is where you're taking those techniques and 
that that maybe or maybe aren't in your head uh, practical, you're taking them and you're applying them against a non totally non-compliant opponent. Sometimes with weapons and everything. Okay, so I think um, let's look at some basics and just talk briefly about the connection. I, I um, appreciate everybody coming along. Before I continue, if you haven't uh, subscribed, please do so. The one, two, subscribe and hit the uh, notification bell. And if you have subscribed, by all means, leave a thumbs up and, uh, and a comment. And I try to get to the comments when I can. So anyway, let's look at some uh, Kihon, all right? And basically, I just want to look at the four level, the three levels, the five techniques. Okay, that's it. Good. It's me, some squatting. Stretch the back. If you join in, great. If you don't join in, that's okay. Go and get a coffee while I stretch. I'm carrying a lot of injury at the moment, so I've got to be a little careful. And stretching the back. Let the legs go straight. I do a yoga stretch, one of the Surya Namaskar. Stretching up. Count. Let gravity do the work, remember. Grab a stretch. The G is gra uh, gaze. Make sure you're looking the correct direction so you don't twist the muscle. It also means G for gravity, to get the gravity doing the work for you, which means just relax. The R in grab, the acronym grab, relax. The A means the angle, the alignment, make sure when you do a stretch, you align correctly. And the B means the breathing, so you coordinate your stretching with your breath, of course. I'm just going to have a little stretch here. If you're an instructor, this is a really good stretch to introduce to your students because if you introduce it as part of the warm-up, by the time they actually need it in a kata, the confusion of trying to make it work goes. So from here, Moashuke, it's 
but we do it in a way that particularly stretches the back and spine. So here, over the top, and push to the side. By introducing this to white belts, they pick it up by watching their classmates pull back and behind over the head. You get a really good stretch through the spine with this, and you can hold it as long as you like, particularly that back one. And down. And that's a good little stretch to add into your warm up. Okay, so. So we have Jodan Uke, Chudan Soto Uke, Chudan Uchi Uke, Gedan Barai, Uchi Uke, Gedan Barai. And if there is one 80 20 rule, one simple rule to rule them all, <laughs> like one ring to rule them all, one simple rule to rule them all, and that is elbow connection. Shout out to Kylie Baker in Melbourne, runs the Masubi Dojo. How cool is this shirt? And look at the back too. This is Kylie Baker's T-shirt. Kylie runs a dojo, a fantastic dojo in uh, Melbourne. Shout out to Kylie. But anyway... Um, if there is one thing that uh, is really vital that as an instructor you must get clear in your students from white belt level, otherwise it's too hard later, uh, that is the connection of the elbows. So let's just focus on that for now. Jordan Bukia, look, and there's a great, someone put a picture of Solsai up the other day, rest his side, and there was one photo of Solsai where his arms like this and his arms like that. And you just know it's an upper block because the upper block isn't this part. It's all about closing this part. So it means the hand comes down. And when you're actually fighting under pressure, the hands aren't going to be here and try to pick up. You will never block it. You just don't have the speed or the reaction timing. That's why you, you carry your hands here. And if anything, you can palm down. Okay? And so for the upper block... If someone comes there and you want to block it away, you're coming like this and following up. So in Tihon, upper block, shoulder forward, we drop down the center line. One, like that. Drop straight down the midline. Meet the hand at the elbow, and then as the hand pushes forward, notice it stays in line with my opposite shoulder as I twist in. Down one is the elbow connection. Coming here, see there? Push up. One, cross over, push up. Don't turn first and then block because I can't do it. There's this opening created. One, and you don't want to turn after your block. I mean, uh, you don't want to turn after your block. Kind of, it, it, all these funky things, I can't even really do them. But one, two, and the hand. Pushes up, notice it stays in line with the outside of the body. You don't have to worry about that. That's why you pay taxes. The government looks after all this here. You just have to worry about this little part here. One, spoke to Gene LaBelle today, and he always reminds me how ugly I am. So I just got to look after this little ugly part here. One, two, three. Down, look at the connection right here. Push it forward. One, two, <laughs> Careful not to move the head. Bang. So that's the first thing you teach white belts is here, bang. And you can even get them at doing a drill where the hand's there, boom, and you just get them to drop that hand down. And that covers everything from here down. And then if they want to cover it. So I'm blocking here. I'm connecting the arms. And that gives me control if I want to move in the range or it allows me to continue on if I want to stay out of the range. I don't want to get into too much of that, though, because... Misleading, okay? One, two, three. One, two, three. One, two, three. Take your time with this one. 
drop that down. If you don't have the connection, you don't have a block. <clears throat> that is not enough block because you block nothing. Okay. A block is a lock is a blow is a throw. Where's the lock? As you know, you've got that lock there straight out of pin and two, the very last movement of pin and two. You kick, you block, and you turn that into a lock, into a throw. It's also a blow. Nothing beats a nice forearm jolt right across the chest. Okay, so uh, always think laterally in terms of block, lock, blow, throw as well. Power always comes from the core. Speed comes from the shoulder, but the, the shoulder turn is more to coordinate the body because if I stay here, I don't have the integration. I don't have the biomechanics to be able to do anything with power. Okay, there. Soto uke. Soto uke is the only one where you can start to not see the elbow uh, connection because it's this movement here. But what it is, is it's really important to come across the center line. So one from behind. Two. One. Look, the elbow almost disappears. In fact, don't start here. That's nothing in that. You're not developing the correct uh, biomechanical or neurological pathways. One, two. One, two. You see there's a double block there too. Remember, blocks are always about protecting the neck and head. So that movement there, look. <laughs> That roll there is almost like um, Floyd Mayweather's peekaboo style. And even with peekaboo, there's always that elbow connection. He's always pulling the back elbow as far forward as he can to so get that back elbow connection. If he's like this, he's going to get nailed every time. Okay. But for Uchiuke, look, this block here, <laughs> there, and you take it out. There, take it out. Have I used this? I've never used it as a block, but... Like I said, this is so interesting. I counted every technique in every kata of Kyokushin. And I tried to, oh, Nick Pettis, hey, buddy. Like I said, I, once I did a count of all the techniques in all the kata, and I figured that would give you a volume, a volume that de determines the relative importance of different techniques. The most common technique in all the kata, of course, is Chudanski. The second most common is Uchiuke. Well, I find that interesting because mo most people will tell you in Kumite, it's not something you use. But what it is used all the time is when you connect your hands and use it in relation to other blocks. So I'm here like this, boom. And if, I'm, if I want to bridge the gap to take someone down or if I want to bridge the gap to close in to, to the grappling range, well, then look, here's the block. They throw the punch, boom, there's the block. And look, here's the Uchiuke. There, here's the Uchiuke. We do it like this, but you turn the hand into Tensho. Look, and then you have the arm drag, then you have the two on one, and then you have the connection building up with your body and theirs. And remember, today's theme is that connection. So, Uchiuke. By my recollection, it's also always taught the back hand stays forward. The bottom hand wipes, see like that. So as I turn, this hand stays forward, and look, there's my elbow connection right there. There's my block connection right there. This can turn into shitomoashi. There, block. Look, that front hand. As the body turns, it stays facing forward to keep your opponent at bay. If you can imagine that, boom, they're coming in. One of the best ways to deal with them is that push. It's like the argument about... Gerambarai in Taikyoku Ich, one. I remember I had an argument with some guy, one like that, who doesn't know his karate. <clears throat> Two, he's going, well, that's a wasted movement. But I guarantee I have used that on recollection probably three times in my life in situations against non compliant opponents. When I needed to move in, that hand becomes the controlling distance. And even if there's a punch in my eye or finger in my eye, I have that hand out so I have a range finder so I know that I can punch. Well, it's the same here under pressure. If I want to get that block going on, their arm's coming in. Look, that arm keeps the distance 
that arm keeps the distance. I can block like that and block there, there. See like that? So when you're doing the technique, one, two, one, two, one. Look at the elbow connection. Look at the shoulder cover, two. And notice you're not going to get the shoulder cover if I turn my head. If I turn my head too much, there's too much of a hole here. The right just comes straight over the top. I have to keep my head still so that when it turns, the shoulder interrupts. One, two, one, two. Okay. Soto again. Again, shoulder, jaw connection. One, two, one, from behind, two, one, two. Now that's the technique which tends to be seen more commonly in tournaments. It's just that tap across like that, or the tap down uh, when, with gloves on. You don't see this one more as much, but this is more common in kata. Okay, so we want to go outside for this one. We want to go uh, from the outside for this one. One. Two, one. Like I said, this is the one where you don't see the elbows connect, but you do see the jaw, the neck, and the shoulder connect. Just like in Mawashiuke, just like in Mawashiuke, Shuto Mawashiuke, and NK Yakuski. Remember, they're all intimately connected. One, two. Okay, Gedambara. Look, there's your Gedambara. Again, you have elbow connection. Turn in, down. If I don't have elbow connection, I don't have an effective defensive mechanism. Ah, 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 ah. You see this all the time. Connect the elbows, bang. If you connect the elbows, you don't even have to be fully conscious of what they're coming at you with. That movement will allow you to cover what comes in and bridge the gap so you can close the gap towards uh, uh, the grappling range, of course. Why does Soto Uke start from behind the head when you only really use it super short version in fighting? Because, Nick, if I may, um, I tend to believe that a lot of the basics are designed to develop neurological pathways. And just like a child who's trying to learn fine motor skills, when they start writing, they write large. They learn to write with large motions because they need to control the neurological pathways. And then later on, when they get it, they can control those pathways with short motions. But when you're working just with the hands in, in the front of the body, that movement there, as you know, for someone who doesn't fully understand what's going on, you can have the misinterpretation that it's the elbow or the hand doing all the work. But really, it's just the end of the pathway, the neurological pathway, starting from the feet through the hara, through the waki, and out. So this movement here, coming from behind, one, I, I think 30 basics works the body in 30 different ways. So you have uh, 30 different applications of flexibility and stretching. This movement here is a large stretch. And it's only when people start to shot it, cut it short that they get tight through the back. But you open it up to... Uh, by doing that deep, that big, big range of motion, you're actually creating large lines of neurological firing. So it's always easier to cut something short than it is to cut it, expand it long. So if you have this movement down, you get a good feel of the spinal axis, the rotation through, the feel of the centrifugal or centripetal force, everything turning off the hara like that. Uh, which you won't get if you do this. It's too easy to confuse it. That is much clearer than this because you can get away with this with the, with the body hardly even moving. And then under pressure against a non-compliant opponent, you have no coordination in your body. You have no connection in the body, which means you have no power. So they're just going to blow straight through everything you do. Us. Thank you for asking, Nick. <laughs> Tobio, Uchiuki is often taught that you should place the fist of the bent arm on the opposite shoulder. You mean here? 
I don't think that's sufficient. And I don't recall Solsai teaching like that. I recall Solsai basically maintaining that angle, which is slightly more than 90 degrees. As you know, I'm not a 90 degree person and I'm definitely not a 45 degree person. I'm always slightly beyond 90 degrees because then Archimedes takes over from Newton. When you're 90 degrees, it's how strong your muscles are. But if you can push it out even more, then you start to get the leverage of your bones. Okay, so I was always taught to keep that angle in the body. And later on, when you do it, it's a natural thing to maintain that shape. Because if your hand's too close, if you've got gloves on, different ball game altogether. Um, but if you have no gloves on and your hand's too close, you're still going to get knocked out, as you know. On the other hand, if you do have gloves on, you want to be close because you're going to close all those gaps. Toward obviously, you seem to let go further back and create protection with the shoulder. Yes, so that's correct, Torbjorn. Here, all the way across, and I won't get that connection with the shoulder if I turn my head. Now, remember, you should always try to keep dominant head position where your eye focal lengths are the same. I turn my head even a little bit. Now, this focal length and this focal length are that far apart. So it's when you're talking about milliseconds of having to react against movement, you're just not going get, to get the same movement when you're like this. The only time you ever go like that is when you're rolling off something to come under. But for the sake of basics and kihong and anything to do with connection with your body and theirs, dominant head position. You want to keep it dead set, centered on the spine if you can. So it means when I do basics, I don't want to go, see my head turning like that? I want to keep my head as straight as possible and I bring the hand from behind across there and you get that connection of the shoulder in some techniques the connection of the shoulder is more rel uh, more relevant and more prevalent than in others but the movement is always universal okay even in get umbara <laughs> let me go back even in get umbara look shoulder movement I'm here like this boom that movement there is what you need all the time. Boom. And as you step back, they throw the front kick. That front kick can easily turn into a head kick. Okay, so boom. Sometimes the hand's down, you want to roll that shoulder. Boom, like that. So I'm here like this. There's my block. There's the shoulder protection. There's the cox comb. There's the elbows. There. So I'm moving as I'm moving away. There. Like that. This shoulder protection covers you from the thing that you don't see. Is it a 100% cover? No, nothing ever is. But in 80-20, you've got to have your shoulder, arms, and body in one position or another. You've always, you're always better off having it in the correct place. Okay, get on, but I look, shoulder protection right there because my head's straight. If I turn my head, there's no shoulder protection now. So I keep my head straight, elbows together. We do a drill in the dojo where we just get people, they can throw head punches, throat grabs, chest punches, body punches, groin shots, and all the students do is they stand there and then they do get on by or Jordan. But as long as their elbows come together, even if they don't know where the partner's shooting, they can pick it up. It's a good drill. If it goes low, well, you take it away there. If it goes high, you take it away there, come forward. And that's the other thing too. Look, you can throw the get on with the upper body moving back and the bottom leg staying there. Of course, you have to be conscious of kicks and so on, but we're working on the idea of the kick. We move back because as they throw that kick, if they've got a long kick, you, you can fade your head away by dropping the back leg. Okay, with a jodan uke, you actually push the upper body forward. So when you move, often in kata, the, the bottom half of the body, see that, will lead the get on The bottom half of the get on Whereas with the upper body, with the jordan uke, the jordan uke will lead the upper, the, lead the lower body. So it's a, that's a very interesting concept that you can work on too. And probably the most important block in kihon, which you need to get really right, is uchi uke gedambarai. For a start, it's not a windmill. I mean, it's not an airplane propeller moving at the same plane as your body. It comes in and out from the side. It comes in and out. It's just like gedambarai. It's just like uchiuke. So it's a combination of uchiuke, get on butter. Uchiuke, get on butter. In, out, see, hands come in. We used to say it's like you're a, an officer with epaulettes on your shoulders and you're coming from here 
you actually rip those epaulets off your shoulders. Take the epaulets and rip them off the shoulders. So your arms from the side come in and out in this motion. Most important of all is the elbow connection. Elbow connection. And if you have that elbow connection in the Ushinka Gerambara, it almost becomes peekaboo. It's like this. You have the shoulder here. Your, your uh, elbow kind of hangs around your kidney, so they're not going to come around with a big kidney shot. The hand is here like this, and this elbow connects. And now I'm rolling off like that. Uchiuke. Gerambara. Uchiuke. So the Uchiuke, Gerambara combination in that technique is just absolutely vital to master the connection of the elbow. Elbow, connect. So next time you do a class, make sure first of all that the students connect their elbows. Two reasons. One, like we were saying before with Sensei Nick, that large motion drills neurological pathways just like a child or even a, a um, you know, people who are learning to draw a gun, military, they will go through the motion large and slow without a gun to, cur to carve a neurological pathway. Then they'll put a gun in and because they've done that, they have the neurology firing in the right, they won't kind of get all messed up. Well, it's the same with the large motions. You develop that large motion. Well, here too, you're developing the habit it's all habits. You're developing the habit of bringing the elbows together. One, two, one, two. You have to be careful with some of them too because there's what I call slippage, which you can, often you'll see guys, they'll start well and then it'll slip on the inside. They'll come here, everything's looking good, and then the hand will slip on the inside. Watch out for that. Sometimes you'll see people do it correctly on one side and they'll slip on the other. You say you're doing it wrong. They go, no, I'm not. It's, you show them a video, they go, man, I would never have believed I was doing it wrongly. So one side is like this and then they slip. So watch out for that slippage. It never comes on the inside because if it starts to come on the inside, you get caught up there, your hands are tangled for a split second and it's not going to work. You always come to the outside. Always the outside. Get on butter. Always the outside. Don't come in. See, this is slippage where the hand accidentally goes in because the instructor hasn't paid attention and taught them the correct neurological pathway. What you want to do is make sure you go down the arm. There. 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 Uchiuke Gerambara. Elbows come together. There. And the second thing, Uchiuke Gerambara, you get the elbow connection, then the hands come in and push out. I used to do it, I don't know if you can see this, but a good way to practice it is with your back fists on the wall. Come in and make sure the back fists hit at the same time. Hit the wall at the same time. And that will develop that good flow and good habit. Then, of course, you've got the circular blocks, Mawashiyuke, Shito Mawashiyuke, and Enke Gyakuski. And these three blocks connected are what defines Kyokushin and the difference. What defines Kyokushin, it's not a hard style, it's a soft style that trains hard. And the main thing for that, that, that determines that, is the circular motions. Okay, so uh, you have this connection. I know some styles do it smaller than us, but Sosai was adamant about these large motions. And when Sosai is adamant about something, you know it's based on his world, life world experience. When someone says you come up with your finger on the, your thumb on the root of the ring finger, but when you go to the side, your thumb is on the root of the middle finger, to have that perspicuity to be able to define that difference can only come from one thing that's having used it under pressure against a non-compliant opponent otherwise it all just becomes dance karate as also used to love saying so mawashi you care here there's a block there there's a block there there's another block there and then there's the attack so one two three you can even come across the center line if you want because that becomes another block um, i have to admit I, I don't recall ever using the whole thing but where i have used it is coming inside someone and then spinning them so this movement here here 
I've never actually pushed both sides, but what I have done on a couple of occasions is I've pushed and pulled. See, like that? So I'll come here and I'll push the hip and pull the shoulder, and that allows me to go behind for a choke or control out of Saiha, the last movement out of Saiha, where you turn around and here. Cross the neck, cross the face, and in the lower back. Well, that is a version of this. The only difference is instead of pushing both hands, you're actually pushing one and pulling the other. And as you know, I'm, I'm a big stickler for push-pull. A push-pull is always better than two pushes or two pulls because uh, you'll find rotation and you'll break down their uh, balance controls. Okay, so one. There's the block. Look. Uh, look. Look. There's an upper block there. There's a Gedambare there. There's an Uchiyuke there. Okay, so this is why it's good to teach it from white belt because you get this movement. Bang, look, see that? Pick a boo. Block up. Boom. Spin. Add connection. Once you have connection, you can go from here to here and control from behind. And of course, what's the best place in the world to be against a real bad guy is behind him. So that's the uh, Maashuke. Now, Shito Maashuke, interesting. Kyokushin is the only style that does Shito Maashuke. Other styles do Shuto Uchiyuke, I mean uh, Shuto Uchi, Shuto Maashuchi, like Shotokan, there's like that. It's a strike. Kyokushin is a circular block. Well, where does that block happen? Of course, the block happens here. It's not happening out there. So the notion that the block is here and I'm going to grab the hand and hit, it's just nonsensical. The action happens here. So as the punch comes in, this is the part I need to be careful of. Just whack myself in the ear and gave myself a ringy ear. Okay, so look, Moashiyuke needs this shoulder connection. And Solso was adamant about large circles. You watch anything that Solso ever did, it's never here. Here. The only time I ever saw him do that was when he was setting up for a photo. Otherwise, the movement was always large motion. Large motion. Large motion creates connection with the shoulder, the neck, and the jaw. That's that safety movement. One. Here's the action. This is where the block has to happen. You block there, under pressure against a non compliant opponent. You can imagine that you're not going to be doing this with your chin up. What you'll be doing is going, whoa! It comes flying in, boom. And then what you can do is you can use that then to bridge the gap to close into the grappling range. You can't stay outside. You wouldn't use this technique so much if you wanted to stay outside. You just block, You'd just be doing this. But if you want to bridge the gap, you're looking for the opportunity to upset their rhythm and up interrupt their uh, offense. So that's where you come in. See this movement here. Look, all this, you know, protecting the head. And look, bang, this movement here. There's your opportunity. Here comes the punch. I block it with my shoulder. And I'm going to move straight in on top of them and use that circular motion to bridge the gap. And, of course, once your head's on their chest, uh, so that's that. The action is always here. It's not out where your hands are. It's here. So one, two, there's the block. Big three. Now if I want to grab the arm and the hand's here, well, then I actually have a good bite on it. I'm not going to grab it at the wrist. I'm going to grab the elbow and slide down to the wrist if I want. And now this hand can come in with an elbow dislocation or an interruption or a strike over there if you want to grab or you're just going to follow that hand in to close the gap. There. There's the shoulder block. Large motion. There like that. Large motion. It's not like Shotokan. That's a strike. It's a good effective strike. If you've ever whacked anyone right on the neck with Uchiyuke, that's their shto uke, which we often, they do it from this back stance here, there, which we compare to our shto uh, uke, is actually closer to shto kubuch that we do in basics. That's what it is. It's a strike. 
Ours is Moashi Uke. Have to be clear about that. Then look at the connection between Moashi Uke and NK Gyakuski. Look, NK Gyakuski. There's it. Defense. Boom. Remember in kata, when you move back, you're defending. When you move forward, you're attacking. So as I move back here, I'm going from this side to this side. My center of gravity only moves that much. I'm going here. There's my defense right at the shoulder. That if I come here like this, I've just been knocked out. Bang. Crack. You just come straight in there. So what I need to do is cover all the way to here. See that? And that allows me now to bridge the gap and move in. NK Gyakuski here. Boom. Look, NK Gyakuski, ah, oh, I tricked you. It's actually Moshuke. NK Gyakuski, ah, oh, I tricked you. It's still Moshuke. Oh, I'm a tricky son of a gun. I say to my students, what's the art of fighting? And they all go, sneakiness. <laughs> they know that the art of fighting is sneakiness because the guy that you're facing is intent on being sneaky and you're intent on being sneaky to him. If you didn't need to be sneaky, you wouldn't be. Harry, you mean like this? Or mean like this? That doesn't, that's not wrong. That's interesting. Barry, Harry says he was taught to have the hands back to back at the head. More to the point is here's the way that I recall being taught by Soulside. Back hand on top. And then I, I treat it as a football pass. Pass that ball. Boom. But my hands open like this. So I've seen people where they come here and they go like that. See this? And I never got into that. It doesn't make sense to me. I was taught back hand on top. As you come back, they open like a book and then they come up to the face. Now, having now, if this is the way you do it, I can't see why not if it works for you under pressure against a non-compliant opponent. But I can't also can't see why, because with speed, your hands don't have the time to do this fine motor skill of turning in. And if you convince yourself that that's important, you're going to be wasting time, even if it's a microsecond and every microsecond counts. But if the hands are like this, what you do is you bring them up, see, like that, and you don't be too concerned about little things like which direction the hands are facing, all you want to do is concentrate on defending your head and creating that centrifugal force so you can come back again. Boom. You know. And don't forget too, look, you've got the cock hand there. Boom, this circular stuff. You put gloves on and you fight sport and everything changes because it's all fist. You take the gloves off and now everything becomes knife hand, cock hand, shoot dog, bang, bang. Bang, bang, this sort of thing. Here, crack, cock hand, cock hand there, cock hand back there. Um, it's all circular. So anyway, can you see the connection between upper block, gerambarai, uchiuke, uchiuke gerambarai. They all essentially start from here. One, upper block. One, downward block. One, uchiuke. One uchiuke gerambara. They all start from the same position. But if you've never drilled the habit of bringing the elbows together, then that connection disappears into the ether. You don't even see it there. Um, the other good thing about making sure the elbows come together is it will help maintain a good flexibility through the back. Um, do you mean like this, Harry? Or like this? Anyway, it doesn't matter. Look, Harry's point is that he was taught to do it a different way. When you're in Rome, in Japanese, they say, go ni iru to go ni shitagae. When you're in Rome, do what the Romans do. Okay. Um, so some schools might say to you, do it like that. Some schools will say it, do it like this. Yeah, it's fine. Just go, oh, it's okay. But under pressure against a non-compliant opponent, when speed is adamant, I guarantee whether it's like this or will be completely irrelevant. What will be irrelevant is how quickly you can stop getting knocked out up here um, and then of course you take those basics and in moving basics you connect the movement with your body so the upper block is led by the upper body the gedambarai is led by the lower body or rather the upper block leads the body that's interesting i find that really fascinating because i've actually experimented with that when i'm fighting i'm training with 
mixed fighters is this movement here where you actually shape and cover with an upper block and that acts as a forearm jolt so you literally lead the body in with the upper the upper, upper block and then that leads into collar ties underhooks and everything like that whereas again on but of course the upper the, the lower body will step in if you want to make a advance in with a get on but the bottom leg unless you're doing that of course but then you'll see what happened the other day in the ufc when that girl did that and got knocked out with a really nice head kick look if you've got any questions put them there now i don't know if nick's still here but it's nice to see nick come along what's dave i just saw yours there too thanks good to see you dave uh the books are out and the good news canada the books have arrived with the distributor the last lot of books to arrive have finally reached the distributor uh today's friday he is um well it's friday here it's probably thursday night there i believe rochelle but anyway so the distributor is going to get on to the canadian orders this weekend so that's great news that was the last of the distributors to receive the other interesting news is of the distributors a couple of distributors are getting down to their last few books so that's a good sign i know uh the distributor in um in holland is down to less than 30 books he maybe got two dozen books left uh so that's good news um i just had another order for 59 books and another order for 64 books both to different um i was speaking to rochelle yesterday and she was looking for the video on the stomp turn drill let me run through that for you um the stomp turn drill is particularly useful when you work on jigsaw mats and I, like i've said a million times it's just a matter of time before some uh, sports scientist gets around to doing a uh, thesis on the connection between uh, ankle knee and hip injury and jigsaw mats if you pay train on jigsaw mats for any length of time uh, you can guarantee that if you don't make adjustments you will I don't know that he trained with Kinjo Hiroshi. Maybe Mike Clark can answer that. I don't think so. Also trained with Kin Kin Kinjo Hiroshi, other than maybe they met and exchanged some techniques. But Richard Kim trained with Solsai. Richard Kim was an early student of Solsai's, um, and they met that way. Uh, it's possible that Richard Kim was older than Solsai, but certainly he he has mentioned that he um, trained with Solsai. Um, yes, yeah, so a stomp turn is really important. And it rose not only out of the desire to create a coordinated power in a kick, but also what it does is it protects your joints from injury. So let's quickly look at that. Rochelle said she'd remind me, and I'm glad she did. We've got a couple of minutes here. So stomp, turn, drill. Basically, you can divide it into three, four, five, or six movements. Maybe I should organize that study one day after I can yeah there you go I guarantee it'll be a groundbreaking study and the sellers of jigsaw mats won't be pleased because I guarantee that using jigsaw mats as opposed to a wooden floor or even a judo mat creates incredible stresses on the ankles knees and hips that wouldn't exist otherwise so my way of overcoming it and teaching kids to avoid it is what I call the stomp turn drill so the stomp turn drill in a quick summary, I call, I stomp the kicking leg. Stomp the kicking leg. That creates a tendon reflex. So that builds power. That stomp alone increases the speed that the body will uh, generate. And as you know, more important than F equals MA is the kinetic energy formula, which is half mass times velocity squared. Half mass velocity squared. Velocity squares mean, velocity squared means as you increase the speed for for all intents and purposes as you increase the speed of a technique you exponentially increase the power so the faster you can make a technique the more powerful it is going to be by a multiple so it's always important to keep your speed up okay so stop turn i stop the kicking leg so if i'm kicking with this leg i'm stomping it then this is the injury prevention part stop turn i roll my pants up so you can see Stomp, turn. Now, depending on the nature of the mats, how soft they are and everything, you want to turn that kick as much as you can. Stomp, 
turn, tuck. See that? You tuck your leg. That's the third part. You can cut it short, stomp, turn, kick. But let's look at the notion of the tuck. Stomp, turn, tuck, kick, tuck, extend. Why do I extend? I, don't, I want to step in and extend, even though under, under reality you might be doing this, moving around and keeping your distance, but the reality is you want to get power on the kicks, you've got to have your body weight behind it. So a good drill is to come in and move forward like um, your head buddy. So when we're working on a punching bag, we tell the guys to headbutt the bag afterwards just to make sure their body weight is moving forward. So we have stomp, turn, tuck, kick, step, rotate, and we call this, Dave Cummings will tell you what we call it, when I was working with his young Lions fighters in uh, Norway, we were doing this a lot. We call that the sneaky, sneaky. Stomp, turn, tuck, stomp, turn, tuck, kick, step, rotate, sneaky, sneaky. What do I mean by sneaky, sneaky? It's just you're developing habits. Stomp, turn, tuck, kick, step, rotate, and the sneaky, sneaky is we tap on the back of the head because I've rotated out of the dead zone and I'm right behind, so I tap them on the back of the head. So it makes it reminds me to make sure that I have the distance correct but it also reminds me to throw something. So I push my hand out and throw that technique. And then if they turn around, you can uh, continue on. So the fundamental drill off the back leg, stomp, turn, okay? Stomp, 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 turn, stomp, turn. Remember, you turn that foot as much as you can to protect the joint against injury. If I leave my foot there and throw the kick, guaranteed in no time you'll start to damage your joints. Stomp, turn, tuck. Stomp, turn, tuck. If you're flexible, you bring that knee all the way up to your shoulder. Stomp, turn, tuck, kick, step. Stomp, turn. That turn's important. Tuck, kick. Notice my back hand is still in cocks, coming the elbow forward. The elbow back here doesn't do anything. That's between you and your opponent, where that's where the action is. So look, that's between me and the camera. Even as I turn my body, it doesn't move. See that? It always has to stay in relation to my opponent. Stomp, turn, tuck, kick, step, rotate, sneaky, sneaky. That's stepping off the back leg with the kick. You use the stomp, turn as a range finder as well. So if I'm too close, I can stomp, turn. See that? You use it. If I'm too close to kick off the back leg, stomp, turn. If I want to move, tuck, Kick, step, rotate, sneaky, sneaky. Tap them on the back of their head. So they're the words. Stomp, turn, tuck, kick, step, rotate, sneaky, sneaky. Seven steps. Kick off the front leg, I need to come back. It's the same as the split. The split is what we base all our footwork on in our dojo. There's the split because the kick's coming this way, it's easy. But if the kick's coming this way, I need to switch my feet. So I literally bring this foot back to Yoi and then step off. So here, there like that. Well, stomp turns the same. I need to withdraw that kick to step forward like that. One, two. Kick, rotate, sneaky, sneaky. In our dojo as part of our, our warm-up, we do a series of footwork drills. Step left, step right, step left, rotate. Step right, rotate. Step left, rotate, kick. Step left, rotate, split. Split left, split right, and then we'll also do split right, stomp, turn. Split left, stomp, turn. So like that. So, okay, guys, thank you so much. That's right on the hour. That was pretty good. Patreon family, thank you very much. You may have noticed that I've added another layer to those who have upgraded. I appreciate it. I don't expect you to. I'm not saying you should, but it's really very much appreciated. Uh, I had a couple of people today upgrade uh, as well. So... Have a look at that. If you're not a Patreon family member, God knows why. Uh, it's a beautiful world to share the love. <laughs> but anyway, look, thank you, everybody, for coming along. I don't know if Nick's still here. He's probably chuffed off. He does his own things. I was actually thinking about Nick um, yesterday because I was actually thinking if I really 
wanted to become a, a YouTuber or a vlogger, I would go to Nick's videos and learn because, you know, he spent so much time on television and so much time doing professional uh, TV videos and things like that, that he really understands the fundamentals that make a good video. So you watch his stuff, man, he just has it down. And so if I was going to go really professional with this stuff, I'd spend a lot of time watching Nick's video. So it's nice. I don't, I don't think Nick's here anymore. But anyway, great to see him come along, ask a pertinent question. Us, thank you. Thank you, guys. And I look forward to seeing you next week. So next week I've got Pinan 2 and the Bunkai from Pinan 2. So that's, that's on the cards for next week. I'll have to find um, a partner to demonstrate that. Thank you, everybody. Stay safe. And I'll see you next week. Us.